All right, so I, uh, part of my uh, work on the utmost grant is adding a lot of content to my linear algebra textbook and Tom Judson's abstract algebra textbook and trying to produce those as web, web as uh, Sage worksheets and lots of different formats and things to do with the single cell server now that that exists. Uh, this is all just stuff I, I really started launching into uh, the weekend prior to May 20th. Some of this was sort of my uh, evening uh, relaxation at bug days up at Wallace Falls Lodge. And then the, the conference was looming and I had to drop it for a little while. So I'm sort of right in the middle of all this uh, and I'm learning as I go so things aren't super polished. I was asked uh, by Frank Rusky at University of Victoria to come up and give a presentation to his summer school course. He's taught something for a long time that he called Maple Flavored Concrete Mathematics. So if you know discrete mathematics, you know this book, uh, Concrete Mathematics by Knuth, uh, Graham, and Pesechnik, perhaps. And he loves that book, and it's a great book, and he, he's built a course around it, and he's used Maple in the past. And he wanted me to come up and, and talk about SAGE and start to introduce some SAGE into that course. So I made a couple of worksheets, and I'm going to sort of go backwards here, given the aversion to XML, and show you the final product. Uh, so, so this is a, a standard uh, SAGE worksheet. It's going to look familiar to everybody. There are no big surprises. You might notice that subsections are numbered as you might choose to do. And I don't think there's anything too non-standard in here. You know, the sections are a little bit bolded. And you might take a look at just sort of the information that's up here in the header. So I'll come back and sort of show you where that came from. So that shouldn't really shock anybody, I hope. This is, in uh, again, in my web browser. This is what would look to you like an HTML page. Uh, this should be a faithful representation of what you just saw as a Sage worksheet. And these are a little bit sort of blue, uh, sort of a bluish tint in the background of those boxes that's not coming through on the projector. Those are not live. Uh, I think I could make those, I know I could make those Sage single cell boxes pretty trivially. I tend to sort of write like this, I don't know if I, you know, I'll, I'll define something and I'll talk a little bit about it and then I'll want to use it. That's not going to work right now with the same single cell because the two cells aren't going to remember each other. But Jason promises me we'll be able to get some mechanism for linking. So I'll have to convey in my source somehow that a certain set of cells are, are a group and I get an idea of how I might do that when we look through this. So again, this should, this should you know, numbering and, and a little bit of bolding for sections and subsections and all those kind of things. Okay, so I upgraded, you know, my Firefox and it's been a little while and I hid page source on it. Well, to find it, but now it's over here in web developer tools. <laughs> All right. So this might, be, if you've written web pages, this might look to you like, like, look to you like HTML. It is not. It's it a is, sage element. It is, it is XML, right? So there you've already <laughs> seen a sage element, and I've made you things differently. Uh, inside of a sage element, so sage begin sage and sage uh, input. And then maybe someplace there might be, I didn't do much output on this. So if I was running a textbook or something, I might want output, but I was building a worksheet for a presentation, so I was just going to execute things as I did the presentation. So uh, so my setup now, again, I might change the names and all that. But inside of a Sage block, there'd be an input piece and an output piece. I think I was calling that out. Uh, you will see some things in here like P for paragraph that look to you like HTML. Where did that header come from? All right, so the, the top of my worksheet in my presentation. So you see all that information up there. And you'll see a worksheet begin. And if I scrolled all the way down to the bottom, you'd see the, the slash worksheet for the end. And title, author, affiliation, all that kind of good stuff that you, that you would expect, perhaps, at the top of a paper or something like that. Uh, I, I'm just in the habit of putting these things in as comments so I don't forget. Well, I think I'll come back to that. Uh, so if you notice up here at the very top, there's a little bit of XML voodoo up here. But uh, this thing right here is acting pretty much just like you would uh, incorporate a cascading style sheet. So you do a CSS, and there's a little bit of stuff you have to put there, and you point to the CSS file. I'm pointing to what's uh, that dot .xsl is an XSLT transform. I'll show you that in a minute. But that's a way to convert the XML, really structured information. That's the key point, is this stuff is really structured. That's the way to convert that into some kind of presentation. 
In this case, it's going to convert it to HTML. So when we are... So that's where it goes with like, the Sage block has to have to right. yeah, it turn it into right. something. Yeah, and I'll show you that as we go here. So I think I want to get out of this. I don't think we need to look at that anymore. Uh, so... So here's the XML again, and I, I think my editor really doesn't do any better job of syntax highlighting than the webmaster. So the a, a important point there is that when we were looking at the page here, that's picking up the XML file off the server, and it's picking up this transform file that I'll show you in a minute. And the web browser is interpreting the transform file and taking the XML and turning it into HTML, sort of on the fly. So you can edit that XML, and you can just pop over to your web browser and hit refresh. And if there's no intermediate step, there's no processing to go from one to the other. <clears throat> so the, what's making this all happen is this XSL file. This is an XSLT transform. And I can be more efficient with these now, because I've been working on this for a couple of weeks since. But uh, this is how you process a, the header stuff. So it's looking for the header info, and you see the H1 up on the top. So that's making the first part of that header fairly good size. And it's picking out the title and the event, and then closing up the H1 block. And then it's, and they're both centered. And I probably shouldn't be putting the CSS in here. That should be somewhere else. But this is just sort of a quick and dirty experiment. And then there's a block of H2 that has basically my name and the date in a slightly smaller, whatever the web browser is going to choose to do with that. And that's the end, and that's the end of a template. Okay. What's nice about these transforms is you don't have to sort of write any flow control. You just say, whenever you see a header info, here's what I want you to do with it. And in this, there may only be one header info. There may be lots of sage blocks buried in different places, and I'll show you the sage block part in a minute. But whenever you hit a sage block, this is what I want you to do with it. And, and there's... This stuff gets pretty complicated, and I don't claim to know it all, but I've been able to do a lot of things with my book. Uh, XSL number, so the numbering that you saw there, that comes from this command in here. It's saying we want to sort of multiple, multiple level numbering, and we want to go by section dot subsection. So that's all pretty much happening just with that command right there, and that's part of how you deal with a subsection. Subsections are getting their title as an H4 kind of thing. This could be cleaned up a little bit and made a little bit nicer. This uh, processing file is actually parameterized to do two things. It's to build the worksheet version and to build the HTML sort of preview or, or however you want to think of that HTML view. And uh, all this stuff up towards the top, margin left, padding, and all that kind of stuff, that's making the, the pretty blue boxes and indenting the, the results at the bottom, if there are any, and making them blue. And if I had sent in as my, the parameter I'm calling purpose, if I'd sent the parameter that was purpose in as build a worksheet, then it's going to write out the triple braces. If you ever looked at the text version of a worksheet, it's going to write out the triple braces, whatever the in stuff is, these three slashes that break up that group, and whatever the output might be, if there is any, and triple braces to end that. And if there is no output, you don't have to, you don't have to put an if in here. If there is no output, nothing happens. You just get that matching triple brace on the end that you need, and you're done. And that is really, I think, the only place I use the parameter. Now, the stuff that this spits out, I take that back. I didn't spit out header like a head and a body for the Sage worksheet stuff because the, work, the notebook takes care of that. Now, I actually had to cut and paste this into a blank worksheet, but I can, I think, automate that quite easily with a really short Python script. Any questions? I'm going to show you what, what I've done with my book on this, but that's that's the under the under the hood kind of stuff. So if there's any questions about it, all this, all right. Yeah. So we'll go back to the no stupid questions thing. Sure. Uh, what, what's the purpose of converting to the XML format? Is it just just to, to really structure your information in the first place and be very clear about how things are all related. So is this for easier long time long term use, or is this for easier presentation and through different it's, web formats? It, it, yeah, it's it's for multiple output formats 
Okay. And that output format you haven't heard about yet. Okay. So so I started my book eight years ago. Yeah. And the notion of an ebook really wasn't on the horizon then. If I had written an XML back then, I think I could generate an ebook with embedded single cell servers and math jacks and all that quite quickly. Okay. And that's a, that's a comment I should make. So in my source for math, I just use dollar signs and let math jacks do all of that for me. So it's in, math jacks is part of what's enabling everything I'm doing. So I have a question. I'm yeah. a bit confused. So if I have a, I just write something on the notebook, right? And then yeah. I grab the, I download the notebook. Yeah. And then I can run something on it and you turn this into XML? No? I'm going the other way. I'm authoring in XML. Oh, okay. And then producing notebooks. Okay. Yeah, you could probably, if your if your HTML that you wrote as part of authoring a worksheet was strict HTML, what's right. called XHTML, if you always balanced your tags, you could probably process that with this tool uh -huh. and, and turn it back into XML and then turn it into something else. Uh -huh. That's not really the that's really not the direction I'm interested in. Sure. Yeah. Sure. How do you handle um, print output? So, so, so what I, I didn't do that with this experiment, I'm going to do that with, maybe I did, I can't remember. Uh, you could write a transform like I'm showing you right now to take that same structured information and spit out what you would think it would look like in LaTeX, in the letter for PDF LaTeX. So you just have a different purpose for? Exactly, yeah, and I would probably just write a whole, it would be so radically different, I probably wouldn't write a parameterized uh, style okay, file, I'd write, a, I'd write a whole new XSL to do that. Uh, I wouldn't try to clutter it up with a lot of Fs. Yeah. What about like if you had uh, mini pages or, or um, you know, columns and you had a text width? Yeah. Like, so how? So so why are you doing? Why are you doing it? Why are you doing a mini page? Is that a historical node out of the sidebar? You know. So what is your? So your XML. I think you should say historical node, oh, and then decide how you. How do you want to display a historical node as a web page, and how do you want to display a historical node as a uh, PDF type thing. So you would none of those sides of anything like that would go into XML or yeah. the XSL. The XML would be all sort of would, would strict, no presentation. Okay. And, you know that's sort of the, the promise of LaTeX is that it, you know people say it's it's content not presentation. But if you've looked at anybody's LaTeX, yeah. they've gotten carried away with presentation, <laughs> and it's not totally structured. Where does a sub sub section in LaTeX end? The next sub sub section begins. Or the next, or the next sub section, section begins. section begins. Well, because the what sub sub section begins. means is put this stuff in this font size, right? It doesn't mean the stuff after this is included in me. Right, yeah. So, what I did with my textbook eight years ago was I did a lot of begin end environments, and that's, that's saving me a lot of grief right now. And I was sort of thinking this way without really knowing it. You're pretty good at this. Can I just send you some like this? Sure, yeah. I've, <laughs> that's part of what's going on here is I've seen a lot of people's attack the last couple of years. Yeah. And uh, the French Sage book is very good, but they had 10 authors for 10 chapters. Yeah. And each, out in each chapter, you know, some were, some were easy to parse and go through, and some not so much. You know. All right, so let me show you, and hopefully my internet connection is still good. So this is my textbook, and this is mostly something that David Farmer at uh, American Institute of Mathematics started, and he sort of went 80% of the way as a sort of demonstration or proof of concept, and I'm now going to really take this on and, and do this fully for my book. Uh, Chris Godsell, the University of Waterloo, he, I'm working on him with a little sort of monograph project, and he just wants to write in HTML and MathJax. So, he's, it, and so I'm trying to nudge him just a little bit to, to some XML that looks like... Uh, HTML. But so this is this is my my current projects. What I'll be doing next week once we're we're done wrapping up the conference, and I'm just experimenting with two chapters and four sections here. So we'll look at. Uh, and Jane really set me up. Jane showed you the previous uh, version. You see that gray stuff? And it's gone away. Uh, Jane showed you the previous version of my experiments of turning my book into HTML, and there's lots of shortcomings. And she pointed some of those out, and I'm trying to, to get over some of those. Uh, I think the, I, these quote marks aren't mine. I think that's coming from some CSS that I stole from David. But uh, there's a subsection on linear combinations. And the nice thing, uh, everybody says my book is too long, and it is. But there's, 
pretty much the whole section in maybe two or three full sort of web pages. And what we've done is the examples and the proofs are all sort of hidden away. And again, this is something David Farmer and Harold Schilly, who's the webmaster for Sage, have worked on. Uh, David likes to call these things knolls, like the, like the first part of the word knowledge. So here's an example, and if I click on that, the web page just sort of opens up and slides that whole example into that space there. It's running off the box. I guess we have to figure that out. And then you can... Mastex can wrap that. Pardon me? Mastex can wrap that. Oh, oh, really? Now, these days. Oh, yeah. okay. Are you using Mastex too? Uh, yeah, this is MathJax. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. I'm using whatever the CDN is giving me. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Jane talked about reading questions. You know, I just sort of buried, you know, if you want to do those, you do those, and there they are. I think those are the same ones maybe that Jane was showing us. The exercises take a while to render, so the page loads a little bit faster just by dumping all the exercises into a place all by itself. Uh, what was that going to work at? Your archetypes are right there too? I haven't done the archetypes but yet. But they would be? Yeah, they will be. Yeah, that's, that's sort of the one big piece that I've got left. Have you written going. anywhere what your workflow looks like? Have you written the sign anywhere? I'm still figuring it out. Still doing it? Oh, okay. <laughs> so I've got a quick and dirty Python script. So I'm taking my LaTeX and turning it into XML, and I'm just going to orphan my LaTeX. And, I, and I'm experimenting as much as I can before I have to go to sort of hand editing to fix minor problems. So I've got a Python script that's doing a lot of things, and then I've got a big set script that's doing a lot of other things. So once so, you have yeah. once I have the XML, XML then you know, that's what I'm going to work with. Yeah. Because presumably you could then regenerate a lot of that from the XML. Yes, that, that's what I will do. Is I'll just spit out the LaTeX that I really that I always wanted. <laughs> so the solutions are all hidden in uh, cool. a different chapter. Some of these may not, yeah, some of these aren't going to open because I didn't do every chapter. I thought I was in a different So the solutions are nulls. The solutions are all nulls, and they're, and they're only nulls. Mm -hmm. So if you click on a theorem someplace else, uh, you will get, if you click on a theorem someplace else in the book, it'll open up the statement and then a null for the proof. But the solutions are, are, are never sort of present in a page. And ignore all that commute note stuff. That's going to go away when I, I haven't incorporated the Sage stuff yet. That's the other thing I haven't done. But that will be, that will be fairly trivial. But I had a good example. Uh, so there's a solution. And I think it references this theorem from this section. So you can click on that theorem. And then the theorem opens up down at the bottom. And it, it has a proof. That you can open up. That's all got to be fixed. Oh, it doesn't like, like it doesn't open up in the same place. Yeah, it opens sort of below the next paragraph, and I haven't gone through and put in enough paragraph. Mm -hmm. You open up and there's a sage cell there, and you can interact with that. Yeah. And then you can and there's a that. definition. I guess that definition does is not one of the sections that I can. That Wikipedia doesn't do this. Well, you can. So when you get when you when you go down and down and down like this, you can just close them all up. Oh, we're going to the top. You don't have to close them up one by one. And now if I open the top one up, will it open everybody No, it won't. Oh, okay. It'll give you sort of reset things right. totally. So this, I, in my, when writing the book originally in tech, I wanted to make a nice table of notation. And you don't have to think about it very long, but sort of the right place to put notation is in the definition that it, it is associated with. So I had a, a my tech command in there. And I could never quite get all the notation pieces out into a list and somehow have the list remember the definitions and all that. So in the course of transforming this, there's one step where I just go, you know, I've already processed everything once to make a lot of pages. I go back and I say, just go through the whole darn source code and pick out every definition that you see. And once you look at a definition, see, remember which one it is. And then if there are any notation blocks in there, pick up those notation blocks and make a row of an HTML table. And before I start, I need the header and when I finish, I need a row. So I can make, I'm calling this sort of reference section, and Jane, this is where the archetypes will probably go somewhere down to here. So I've got all these lists, like I've got a list of all the definitions in those four sections, and they're all nulls. 
But I really sort of liked the, what, what I was able to do with the notation that I just couldn't ever quite make the tech do. So I've got example usage. Uh, I've, I've got Ty gave them all titles as part of creating them originally. But they all sat inside of the definition. So I'm really, really easy with processing the XML to pick out which definition I'm inside of and then create. I've already created the content of, uh, of the null. And in fact, the null even opens up quite nicely in the middle of the table. It's, it's able to break the table in half and do that. So if you've forgotten what the A bar B is, you, you get at least the suggestion that it's an augmented matrix, and maybe that's good enough, but you can go back to the actual definition and see that. Uh, you know, Jane mentioned proof techniques. They're, they're all just sort of back here in this reference section. They're all listed. You, could, you can go back and read them one by one with the nulls, or you can reference those as you need and it's just kind of go pull up. In the, in the print version of my book, I couldn't decide whether I wanted them to be printed in the book where they sh were sort of needed or whether I wanted a hyperlink to an appendix. And silly me, I implemented both with a switch. You know, and I'm, I'm much, I'm all these sort of supplements and all this extra material, and I'm a whole lot happier with what's going on here as far as sort of dumping everything out as web pages and, and linking from one to the other. The Knowles make it work. MathJax makes it work, and getting my source into XML, I think I'm, I'm really happy with this. And, and the reaction I get from everybody, I, I told Dan Drake this, and Dan Drake made a horrible face, and I did about 15 minutes of this, and he started to feel a little bit better about this. Are you feeling better? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Python can generate it. Now they feel better? <laughs> You know, so there are XML editors, uh, I, it, but you got to pay money, I think, for a good one. So I haven't, I haven't crossed that bridge yet. Tom. So um, this null stuff, expanding stuff, and so on. It, students haven't looked at this stuff and tried to read this stuff yet. Have no, they? No, I haven't. I haven't okay, so you have no idea. How I haven't put this before students yet. Okay, so I'd be interested in hearing what students think, because I've stopped predicting because they'll say, <laughs> I want to write, read my book on my computer, and then they'll complain about the computer being too heavy to lug around. Okay, so I did, so David Farmer, at, if you go to AIM site, if you want to implement nulls, it's really easy, a little bit of JavaScript, and instead of doing href, you do null equals. It's really trivial to put a null into a web page of your own. Like I said, David Farmer had sort of like an 80% complete experiment that's at a, the AIM site. So I showed that to my students linear algebra students this last spring, I said, hey, this is a pretty good place to go. It's not complete, but you know, have a look. And you know, I sort of got oohs and ahs when I did the null stuff. I mean, it doesn't mean it's great for them long term, but uh, their initial reaction, I think, was positive. And I don't know how many of them were using that HTML, using that version as sort of a, a primary place to go. I think you should write an ebook on how you write your ebook. Sure. <laughs> but you know, that's what I wanted. So there's this, this sort of, I, I have not found an EPUB reader that I can sort of access that does JavaScript other than this Calibre or whatever, but it's sort of really a desktop program. Just because you haven't bought an iPad. <laughs> it, that, that may be it. Yeah, although, yeah, there's one coming free in our department. Okay. Yes. <laughs> uh, so MathJax, single cell server. Interacts all from XML source. Might make a nice ebook.